Good evening, good evening everyone. How are you today? I hope your day has been fine. Your day went well and you are back home now. Are we ready for Bible study? Let's dig deep into the Word of God. Before we start, shall we pray? Our Lord and our God, we want to thank you for today. We thank you for the grace of going out and coming back home safely. We thank you for the gift of life. Lord, accept our thanks in the name of Jesus. Lord, as we have come to, to your feet to learn of you, to learn your ways, we pray that, Lord, you help me to teach it as simply as possible and that everyone under the sound of my voice will hear it clearly and accurately in the name of Jesus. Change us through your word today. In Jesus' mighty name, I've prayed. Amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah. Glory be to Jesus. I guess your week has been fine. And you did my homework that I gave you last week. I said that every one of us should study the book of Colossians, chapters 1 and 2. Because that is what we are going to study in detail today. So I'll get right into it immediately. Now, the book of Colossians in the Bible was one of the epistles that was written by Apostle Paul. This epistle is so important for us to study and understand because of the fact that it is all about Jesus. From chapter 1 to chapter 4, it exalts Jesus and affirms his lordship. The theme of that letter in some Bibles, if you have Bibles that put themes on chapters or on letters, the theme of that letter is the headship of Christ. So this is about the only um, epistle in the New Testament that really affirms the Lordship of Christ. And the primary lesson from these four chapters is for us to put Jesus first all the time. That is the primary lesson in all the four chapters of Colossians that we should put Jesus first all the time. Jesus should be above and before everything else and everyone else. Jesus should be above and before everything else in our lives. We should put him first in our time, in our finances, in our thoughts, even in our conversations, in our decisions, and in our relationships. Some of us, we want God, Jesus to only be there for us in our health and in our finances. But when it comes to our conversations, when it comes to our thoughts, when it comes to our decisions, even our relationships with other people, we put God aside. No, Jesus wants to be number one. He wants to be first in everything it wants to be first in everything that we do if we keep him first we will never have to strive for or chase after other things his blessings will chase us and overtake us like in deuteronomy 28 and verse 2 where it says that these blessings shall come upon thee and overtake the those blessings will overtake us even in Matthew 6, from verse 31 to 33, where Jesus was talking to the people and he said that, Why do you worry? What will you eat? What will you drink? What will you wear? Why do you worry about all that? That God knows that you have need of these things. And in verse 33, in Matthew 6, 33, it specifically says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all other things... Is it money? Is it material? Is it wealth? Is it relationship? Is it favor? Every other thing will be added to you as long as you keep God first in everything. The epistle to the Colossians, as in the church in Colossae, focuses so intensely on Jesus and encourages us to keep him first place in our lives. Because Paul knew that the believers in Colossae at that time had been exposed to false spiritual teaching 
that said Jesus was not really God. That was why he wrote this letter to them. And we are living in similar times now. We are living in similar times now. A lot of false teachings are going on out there. Do, do you follow them or you follow Christ? It is important to know your God. Know him through his word. Don't, who do you call first when you are in a situation? Do you go to God yourself or you start looking for pastor? Do you go to God yourself or you start looking for pastor to come and pray for you? Or you want to go to a prophet to come and pray for you? They can lay hands on you till Jesus comes. But if you don't have the word of God in you, you will have limited victories. You can have momentary victory when a man of God prays for you. But for you to have continuous victory in your life, continuous, not once, not twice, you need to know God yourself. They that know their God, they shall be strong and they shall do exploits. That is what the Bible says. So we need to put God first and put away all false, false teachings. And how do you know whether a teaching is false? Test it with the Bible. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, the truth shall be established. So anything anybody tells you, check it out in the Bible. If you cannot support it with two or three scriptures, throw it away. Then it's not for you. Now, this letter to the Colossians defends, explains, and promotes the Lordship of Jesus Christ more than any other book in the New Testament. That is why I love it. And this book is so important for us today because we are living in an era, a age where we are not encouraged to put God first. You wake up early in the morning, you go to work. By the time you come back, you want to attend to family, you want to attend other, to other things. The moment you switch on your TV, it is one show or series after the other. You are not encouraged to put God first. That is even if you don't have additional work to do at home that you brought from work. So life will like squeeze all your time out of you. But in the midst of all this, we need to find time out of no time to, be, to seek God's face, to learn God's ways. I pray that God will help us in the name of Jesus. Now, the other reason why Paul wrote this epistle was to instruct the early believers in how to walk in this world as a Christian. A follower of Christ who lives in personal relationship with him in all practical ways. So Paul was trying to show the church in Colossae that you need to be followers of Christ. You need to be Christians. People who live in personal relationship with Christ in all practical ways, in every little thing. In every little thing. Like you know, I, 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 let me share a bit of a testimony. During this lockdown, when the lockdown started, somehow I misplaced my driver's license and I didn't know where it was. And I searched and searched. I checked all my bags that I used during the time, but I couldn't find it. And then one day I was driving and I told the Holy Spirit, Lord, I don't want any um, policeman or metro police to stop me on the way and ask for my driver's license. And if they do, what should I do? And the Spirit told me that I should take my ID with me in the car. So I kept my ID with me in the car. And when a policeman stopped me, I showed him my ID and I told him that I misplaced my driver's license. But luckily for me, I had a picture of the driver's license on my phone. So the policeman looked at my ID and then he, he checked the picture of the driver's license on my phone and he said, okay, but just look for it. And I stopped stressing about it. I asked the Holy Spirit, just help me to find this thing. And just last weekend, on, on was it Saturday or Sunday? My husband and I, on Sunday, we went to wash the car. And the next thing, they found my driver's license inside the car. And I'm like, I've looked and looked all over. But I gave it to God. I said, Holy Spirit, help me with this thing. And without stress, with, without too much 
Also, I found it. These are the little things of life that God wants us to rely on him for. He wants us to rely on him for these things. So please, let us as believers learn to walk in Christ's ways as practically as possible. As practically as possible. So that is like the general message in the book of Colossians. So let's dig into Colossians chapter 1 now. Now, the most important thing you can do in your practical everyday life is to make sure you are living in the will of God. Look at Colossians chapter 1 verse 1. I even I love the way it started. I love the way it started so much because it said Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Look at that. Paul is an apostle. Uh, that is a person sent by God. Right? He is an apostle by the will of God. So he knows that him being an apostle is by the will of God. Is according to God's will. God called him, touched him. We, we all remember the story of how God called um, Apostle Paul even um, on the way to Damascus. So God called him, touched him, and changed his life for a purpose. That is to serve him and help others to know and grow in him. So Paul knew he was walking in the will of God. What about you? Are you walking in the will of God? And you choose to ask yourself, how do I know? How can I know if I am in the will of God? The first thing that will make you know that you are in the will of God in whatever you are doing is that you will enjoy it. God's will for you is not something that makes you miserable all the time. If you are doing something and that thing makes you miserable all the time, that even if you wake up in the morning. Every time you wake up in the morning, you will, oh God, I'm going to do this thing again. Oh, how am I going to cope with this? Then it is not God's will for you. When you're doing what God's will is for you, you will enjoy it. You will have fun. It's not to say that you won't face challenges or he won't be required to make sacrifices. But if it is God's will for you, it will give you the wisdom and the grace to overcome any difficulty. Easily, you will overcome. You will see difficulties as stepping stones and not as hindrances. You jump over them, climb over them one by one. The second thing that will help you to know if you are in the will of God is that you will be equipped for it. Apostle Paul was equipped for what he was doing. When what you are doing is in the will of God, you will be good at it. God gives us the skills, the gifts, and the abilities to fulfill this will, his will for our lives. He does not call us to do something without equipping us for it. He will equip you. All the skills you need, you may not know it. It doesn't appear on the surface all the time. But you just find yourself easing him to eat. You may have to study or prepare some other way to carry out his call on your life. But you will have an aptitude for it and feel at ease in it. It's like, it will feel like you are born to do this. Even when you do it, you feel fulfilled. There's a sense of fulfillment that comes with it. And the, another thing is, don't compare yourself with anybody. The way I teach is definitely different from the way my husband or our senior pastor and our senior pastor missus will, will teach. We all have our different styles. We all have our gifts. We all have our skills. We all have our styles of speaking. 
But the most important thing is be yourself. Don't compare yourself with other people. That's another thing that I've seen in the um, kingdom of God, in Christendom these days. A lot of people compare themselves with others, which is not necessary. Be who God has called you to be. Be who God has called you to be. Don't compare yourself with another person. Even if you all you can do is sing in the choir and you know that you are so good as a how-to, don't compare yourself to a soprano person and think you are not good enough. Your how-to is good enough for God. Your how-to is good enough for God. So please, don't compare yourself with anybody. And to find God's will for your life, it's not like God will always tell you all the time, this is what I want you to do. Sometimes you need to step out in faith and try things until you find what is comfortable. Although what is comfortable does not necessarily mean what is easy. But you need to take a step of faith, step out in faith. Step out in faith and try things out. If you have the urge to sing, you like singing, start from somewhere. Start singing. Over time, you discover, oh, maybe I'm a good soprano or I'm a good alto or I'm a good um, tenor. Or even maybe your voice is baritone. There are so, there are so many musical talent shows, reality shows on the TV these days. And you see so many people that are talented in their own unique way. The same thing in the kingdom of God. We all have our unique gifts from God. Discover yours. Take a step. Step out. Discover your own gift. You may be gifted in teaching. You may be gifted in um Following up people, maybe you're a people person, you like talking. Someone like me, I'm not so much of a talker. But if you are someone that is a people person that likes talking to people, use it for God. Use it to draw people to the kingdom of God. Don't let your talking gifts be diverted towards gossiping. I remember while we were growing up, my dad always tell us that great minds discuss great issues and lesser minds discuss personalities. You, you should check yourself when your conversation with people always tend towards discussing other people and discussing things that you cannot say in front of them. Then that is gossip. Don't entertain such. Don't entertain such. Just focus on what God has called you to do. Use those giftings of yours in the di direction of the gospel. Use it for the propagation of the gospel. I pray God will help us all in the name of Jesus. Another part of um, Colossians chapter 1, there are a lot of messages in Colossians chapter 1 alone. But another part of chapter 1 that I love is verses 9 to 12. And uh, most um, and, um, theology teachers call this the apostolic prayer. And this is very, very important. This apostolic prayer, I pray it like every day. You can see in verse 9 again. Apostle Paul was saying that for this reason, we also, since the day we heard, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. He's talking about the will again. He knows that he is in God's will, but he is now praying for other believers, that every other believer also be filled with the knowledge of God's will. When you are in God's will, you won't strive in life when you are in god's will 
you will be able to confidently say, just like King David, that I would rather fall into God's hands than into the hands of men. Because you know that God, even if God gets angry with you, his anger is but for a moment. But human beings can get angry with you and lynch you. God is the only one that his anger only endures for a moment. The moment you ask for forgiveness, he moves on. He blots out, out your um, sin and takes it as far as the east is from the west. So, please, let us pray that we will be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You will be able to handle issues in life better. You will be able to deal with people. You will be able to forgive easily. You will not take offense easily. These are simple things that makes life easy and you can live life to the fullest. You know, like this thing is simple English. They say you've taken offense. Offense may be given, but it's your choice to take it. Offense will be given by people. You have no control over what people do or say to you, but you have control over what you do. Or how you react to what they do to you. So it is important for us to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. When you are filled with the knowledge of God's will, it gives you some form of peace. It keeps you at peace. You are not stressed. Even when someone offends you, you can easily discern the perspective from which that person is coming. You know that, oh, maybe this person, this is as far as how their understanding is. You'll be able to deal with them in that way. You'll be able to walk in love, even with the craziest of people in the world. I pray God will help us all in Jesus' name. In verse 10, it now says that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, pleasing to all, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Yeah, it's talking about a prayer to please God, to bear fruit and grow spiritually. How many of us can confidently say, if Jesus were to come today, that ah, my life is pleasing to God. Everything I do, the way I think, the way I talk, the way I deal with people, the way I love people, ah, 100%. Nobody is perfect, definitely. We are all striving towards perfection. But can you confidently say like, let's even, 100% is far-fetched. Let's even say like 50% of what you do in a day is pleasing to God. Let's start with that. From there, we start increasing it until, because even our children that we have, they are looking at us. We are the Bibles that they read. Is your own behavior, the things you do, the things you say in front of them, is it reflecting the life of Christ? Is it all those things, are they pleasing to God? Because you can easily correct children, but they will ask you that, okay, but you do the same. Even my youngest child, if I tell him not to do something, we say, but mommy, you do the same thing. And I tell him that be I do that be because I'm an adult. At your age, you cannot do this. So I let him know that that thing is age-restricted, not because it's something wrong. So how can you correct children when you yourself are not doing the right thing? How can you correct your younger ones? I pray God will help us in the name of Jesus. And then in verse 11, it says that we may be strengthened with whole mind according to his glorious power, enduring everything with perseverance and patience joyfully. Hmm. This is a prayer for endurance, patience, and stability. I sometimes ask this question that if Abraham was living in this age, that at the age of 75, 75 oh, God gave him a promise that he's going to have a child. 
And that promise did not become fulfilled until the, he turned 100 years old. How many of us in this day and age will be that patient with God? That we won't start looking for alternatives. But Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Are we patient? Are we patient with God? Are we patient with people? What is your endurance limit? According to Jesus, on a daily basis, you should be forgiving your brothers 70 times, seven times. That is 490 times in one day. So by the, the moment it's 12 midnight, the 490 for today has gone. And you start another 490 tomorrow. Is it possible for you to actually count 490 offenses? For one person, no. Not for everybody. 490 per person. Per person. You have to forgive. How enduring are you? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love endures all things. Love bears all things. How enduring are you? towards others do you get easily irritated do you judge people easily judge not so that you will not be judged we need to learn patience and stability that is being joyful even in the face of adversity that when people see you they always see you happy they don't see you looking morose. It's like some people, you already know their happy face. You know they are, you know when they're in a mood. You know when they are not happy. It got to a point I started teaching myself how to practice joy. Because even with this COVID-19, ordinary news on the TV can destroy your mood for the rest of the day. But you shouldn't allow it. Rather, practice joy. Joyfully endure all things. It's not easy if you want to do it in the flesh. But you have to ask for the help of the Holy Spirit. In verses 13 to 14 of Colossians 1, Apostle Paul was trying to tell us what we have, we have in Christ. That is, we have been rescued from sin and we have been brought into the kingdom of God. Then he also told us who Jesus is. You remember I said that most of, almost every chapter in Colossians talks about the Lordship of Jesus. And in chapter 1 verse 15 to 17, it teaches us who Jesus is. Telling us that Jesus is the image of God. In verse 18, he was talking about the supremacy and the headship of Christ. From verses 19 to 23, it was talking, he was talking about Jesus being our reconciler. That is, God reconciled us to himself through Jesus. And in verse 27, I know most of us know this one. He is our hope of glory. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Do you know who Jesus is to you? Do you know what you have in Christ? You have been rescued from sin, bought with the blood of Jesus, and brought into the kingdom of God. Don't let the devil sell you anything contrary to that. Don't buy the lies of the devil. Anything contrary to that, condemnation, feeling like you are not good enough, feeling like you don't measure up. You are good enough for God. You are good enough for God as you are. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. You are good enough for God. No human being is a mistake. No child is a bastard. Do you know how children have uh, uh, come to be in the womb of a woman? How a woman gets pregnant? Of all the spermatozoa 
released by a man. Only one goes and fertilizes a egg and you think that a child is a mistake. No child, no human being is a mistake. God has a destiny for everybody. Discover your purpose. Discover the will of God for your life. Know who you are. Know what you have in Christ. And know who Jesus is to you. And then in verses 28 to 29, he was talking about spiritual maturity, which is also equally important. In Colossians chapter 2, Paul contended for believers to know who they are in Christ. It's basically about the same thing. But, um, chapter 2 from verse 1 to 5, Paul was talking about you knowing who you are in Christ and what belongs to you in him. From verse 9 to 10, what are the things that Christ has prepared for us? These are the things we need to know. We need to discover them every day on a daily basis. On a daily basis. Becoming the person God created you to be in him. Being rooted and built up. Are you firmly rooted in Christ? Some people just... A few afflictions cause them to lose faith in God. That means they have no root. We all remember that parable that Jesus gave of the seed. As long as you don't allow the word to form root in you, you can easily be uprooted like a weed. Or weed comes and the devil comes and plants wheat in your heart and it kills the plant of the word in you. We need to be firmly rooted and built up in Christ. Don't be taken captive by the devil. Christ is the only true foundation of the truth. That's what he said in verse 8 to 10 of chapter 2. Christ is the only true foundation of the truth. And according to John 8, 32, only the truth can set us free. Nothing else. Whom the Son sets free is truly free indeed. Only the truth in God can set us free. In verse um, 11 to 15 of chapter 2, it was talking about us remembering Christ's victory. Jesus died. He went to hell took the keys of hell, resurrected, and went to sit in heaven on the throne with God. Do you remember that victory every day? Don't let that victory go to waste in your life. You need to make sure that everything that Jesus paid for Is manifested in your life. Every single thing that Jesus paid for with his blood, make sure it is manifested in your life. Remember the victory of Christ. You were crucified with Christ. You died with him. And he has raised you. You resurrected with him. He has raised you with, with himself. Always remember that victory. And don't let the devil sell you anything contrary to that. Don't be ruled by the flesh. Because another thing that makes us forget that victory in Christ, that we have in Christ, is that we have been ruled by the flesh. And the Bible says that to be carnally minded, that is being ruled by the flesh, is death. Don't be ruled by the flesh. Rather, let the Spirit lead you unto all truth. Let the Spirit of God lead you unto all truth. In verses 16 to 17 of chapter 2, it talks about Christ being our reality. Don't let anybody 
teach you false doctrine or tell you don't eat this, don't touch this, don't do that. Don't No, it's not really about the doctrine anymore. Christ is our reality now. So it's not about the law completely anymore. When you are walking in the way of Christ, you are fulfilling the law. Because the summary of all the law that Jesus gave us is that we should love one another. That's it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Walk in love. And you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Amen. Don't fall for the critical judgment of the proud. Those who say, ah, no, don't eat this. You're not supposed to do this. You're not. It's pride. It's a form of pride. Don't fall for that critical judgment. Don't let them trip you at all. Don't let the devil trick you into buying such lies. Let no one judge you regarding food or drink or in respect of a holy day or new moon or Sabbath. That is what Apostle Paul said here. Because judging other people by that is pride. These are shadows of things to come. But the substance, our reality, in, in, in the New Living Translation, 17 says, our reality belongs to Christ. Our reality is in Christ. Don't fall for the critical judgment of the proud. Your love for God should inspire or provoke self-control in you. That is from verse 20 to 23. If you died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you subject yourself to legalistic rules? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. These are, all, these are to perish with use and are aligned with the commandments and doctrines of men. So it, what doctrines and they are important for order in the church, don't get me wrong, but at the same time, they are, they are not the majority. They are not the major things that you should concentrate on, that you should focus on. Let your love for God provoke or inspire self-control in you. So it's not like, yes, you should now be eating everything. No. It's, it's not for you to eat everything, but at the same time, you don't say, I'm not eating this because someone said this or that. If you are with someone that you know that they offered you food, and you know that if you don't eat it, they may be offended because maybe they don't have an understanding of what you do. Or maybe you are fasting and you went somewhere and someone offered you something. It's not sin. If you don't want to tell them that you are fasting, it's not a sin. You can just take what they give you. Worst case, you say you want to take it home. That's fine. But try not to offend the person. Handle the situation in such a way that you won't offend the person. So let your love for God inspire or provoke self-control in you. Nobody is giving anyone license to sin. But if you love God and you love walking in his ways, you will practice self-control and not become a gluten. I pray God will help us all in Jesus' name. Our time is fast spent today. Thank you for joining me. So next week we'll deal with Colossians chapters 3 and 4. Do read it. I hope you have posted your comments on chapters 1 and 2 or questions. I'll have a look at them and also answer them next week. Until next week, when you join me again, my name is Pastor Olubumi Adegelu from Life Center Bible Church in Midrand, in Johannesburg. Enjoy the rest of your evening and remember that Jesus is Lord. Stay blessed.